All right. So hacking a time machine, kind of, sort of, maybe. What do I mean by a time machine? Any guesses? A clock. A clock. Obviously a clock. A clock is obviously a time machine, right? Because it's a machine, and it tells you the time. So it's a time machine. <laughs> yes? Perfect. Let's talk about time. A long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away. Wait, that's Star Wars. Never mind. I wrote you guys a little nursery rhyme for this. Uh, you can read most of it. I'll just read the last bit out to you because it sounds better when it's read out. Old MacDonald had some clocks. They weren't in sync. Oh, no. <laughs> right? That's the trouble with clocks. You have a whole bunch of clocks in your room. They're not in here because it's not a school, apparently. Um, but you have clocks normally. Clocks have some problems. One, batteries run out. Right? Uh, you have to go around replacing batteries. Not fun. Synchronization is annoying. You have to make sure your watch is reasonably accurate. Walk around, synchronize everything down to the second, and then press go on. Well, not press, but like push the little stick in that makes the clock start turning again. Annoying. Lots of work. The other thing about clocks is you can't really monitor whether it's running out of battery or if the time's wrong. You kind of have to send someone around at some specified interval to every single classroom to look at the clock. Waste of time. If I could tell which clocks weren't working, I could just send the person to the four places that the clocks had problems instead of sending him to like, here are n number of classrooms, go to every single one of them. And the other thing about clocks in general across the board is that time drifts. Time drifts a lot less in um, slightly less cheap clocks, shall we put it that way? But it still drifts. Uh, and you want to deal with that. So we're like, all right, we want to do something slightly different from what we normally do in a school. Um, I'm sure some schools already have this setup, had this setup when we installed it two years ago. But either way, we were like, right, I found this online. This is a clock um, from Shanghai Global Time. It's powered over, uh, powered over Ethernet and a whole bunch of stuff. I was like, is this my savior? Well, let's look at it. Uh, does it work for my use case? Do I have batteries? No, it's powered over Ethernet. Does it have time synchronization? Yes, it has NTP. That solves the issue of like, hey, I have to go to every clock and set it to 130104 or something. Monitoring? Um, we'll build something. It's OK. We can get around it. It's, it's, it's kind of like on the internet, well, on the in local network. So I'm sure we could do something. Right? How do you tell the IP of a clock like this? If you were a reasonable manufacturer, you would have the MAC address on the box, on the device, on a, maybe on multiple parts of this device. Well, there is no MAC address anywhere on this device. Uh, I'm sure you could take every single clock, plug it in, and figure it out, but you can't. And of course, you could have the device reported to an IP address. How do you do that with an analog clock? Spin, 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 stop at 10, spin, spin, top at, stop at 21. Where's the 21? OK, problem, right? And you could use seconds, but then uh, IP addresses, each octet goes up to 255. How do you get that with 60, right? It also has more problems. Um, it really is just a motor glued to a standard, off-the-shelf, regular wall clock, which has a AA, sock a AA uh, battery socket into which they soldered two very flimsy cables. It was amazing looking at this, and I, I was completely freaking out. Also, when you set the time, I hope you like watching needles go in circles. It has to f like, if you are two minutes ahead of where you should be, you have to go through a full 12 hours to get to where you're supposed to be. Not fun. All right, do a little more digging. These lovely guys, Global Time. My Savior 2.0? What horror is live beneath your facade? Well, let's find out. Does it work 2.0? Yes, POE. Uh, yes, NTP. Monitoring. We'll figure this out. At least we can get the IP address now. You power this thing on, and it starts off, and, and you look at it very hopefully, because it goes 9999-8888, down all the way to 0000, and then it goes DHCP. And then it waits. And then it goes 192-168-12. And you're like, that's not, we use 10 slash 8. Why, why is that there? And then it goes DHCP. Now it actually worked. 10, 21, blah, blah, blah. And you're like, OK, cool. At least we get the IP address. But that's all generic stuff. On a more concrete level, what do we actually want? Let's talk about features. What features do I want from a bunch of clocks I'm going to have across an entire campus and don't want to be running around touching ever? Not that I'm going to be the one touching it. But I don't want the people whose job it is to be running around poking these things to be going around poking these things if they don't have to. 
So there's two mandatory features that we need. And something like this. Oh, I pulled power out. Uh, yep. All right. Flex. Um, two mandatory features. I need to be able to set the time zone, because when it ships from the factory, it's set to UTC. Now, I love UTC. I wish the entire world used UTC. <laughs> I wish it, it was instead something like you start work at uh, 0, 0, 0, 0004 or like you know at like 12 in the morning. 12 in the morning UTC. You start work. That sounds lovely to me. To most people, they'd be like, "What do you mean I want to start work at midnight?" Like, but it's 8 a.m. Anyway, we need to be able to set the time zone because kids don't get time zones, especially because this is going to be the same from like kindergarten all the way to 12th grade. 12th grade is they know their time zones, they still don't know UTC, they know GMT, but GMT is a pointless time zone. The other thing we need to do is to be able to set NTP servers. Um, the clocks ship from China. Their default NTP server is in China. The latency to the NTP server is roughly 700 milliseconds. NTP is designed to deal with latency on a network. I don't think it's designed to deal with 700 milliseconds of latency on a network. And then there's a bunch of features that I like to classify as, I really want this, but I'll make do if I can't get it features. I'd like to be able to check if the device is configured. And I'd like to check if the time's drifting. All right, let's talk about configuration. If you want to configure a clock, well, how do you configure a clock? Uh, in your mind, the most ideal way of doing it? Well, DHCP. Most of you know DHCP as the thing that assigns you an IP address. Well, when you work on a large network, you use DHCP for a lot more than just the IP address. There's a whole bunch of information, a configuration information that gets delivered to your device um, over DHCP. And RFC 2132, thank God, has time offset and time server options. And boom, the clock should configure itself, right? But we're Shanghai Global Time. <laughs> we do things our way. And this is our way. Oh. It's a lovely little app. If you're wondering why the colors look a little weird, and if, you're, if you look very suspiciously at the Mac bar on top and you think it's because I'm running it on Wine, it doesn't matter. You run it on Windows, it looks the same. <laughs> Quick rewind. How many clocks are we talking about? That number's a bit small. Let me make it bigger for you. That's how many clocks I need to configure. Am I going to sit there poking at a GUI app? Nuh uh. What do we do? We sniff it. Obviously, it talks to the clocks over the network. We sniff the network. We set the time zone, right? And you get a bunch of stuff. It's time. It's time. <laughs> and in that time zone uh, setting giant bunch of packets, eight packets, I think, uh, we look for the string 0800 in, in hex. All this is in hex. Uh, no, it's not there, right? So clearly it's not there. Maybe they send it as a string because we're Shanghai Global Time. Uh, no, th that string's not there either. How about the number of hours between, uh, I don't know, z bit, like, you know, eight hours? Well, how about that in minutes? Nope. How about that in seconds? Nope. Well, OK, fine. Let's try again. NTP servers. These should be easier to find, because there's no really weird way to encode these things, right? There are only two possible ways you could encode it. Host names or IP addresses. Neither of these are in the packet. Congratulations. Is there a method to the madness? Well, this is where I went down a rabbit hole for maybe two days. And then I went, does it actually matter? Do I actually care? Are we getting ahead of ourselves? You have a bunch of packets. You don't know how they work. What's the first thing you try? Send the packets again. Try a replay attack. Does it work? There's your answer. Lol, yes, it works. So initial setup is fixed. Initial setup is fixed? Not really. Um, we have 321 clocks. Um, the firmware locks up if you don't send it the exact eight packets it expects. If you send it seven, it waits for the eighth. If you send it nine, well, it waits for the next seven until they come in. And it's just completely stuck. So you can't really do anything that might be freaky. Uh, also, there's a timer. And if you send too many packets and they reorder because it uses UDP, um, it overflows its network buffer and the firmware crashes and kills itself. It's great, trust me. Thankfully, they put the network part of it separate from the actual clock part of it. So the network can go down, the clock still lives. Um, also, these things are spread across campus, and we don't use a level two broadcast domain across campus because that's dumb. So I need a way to, I can't just say, send this to like the entire broadcast domain and the clocks will configure themselves. It doesn't work. So what do we do? DHCP to the rescue, again, except not the way you might expect by sending good options or something. No, I look at the DHCP server logs and I go, all right, is that a clock? That's a clock, configure it. And you do that for every single clock you see. 
It's kind of annoying, but it works. So initial setup fixed. But wait, what about monitoring? Well, before we do that, let's take a little detour. Neat Tux. This is Tux. If you encrypt Tux, you get that. It looks very pixelated there. It really is just that anyway. But if you use a specific type of encryption called Electronic Codebook, ECB, you get Tux. Can we see the penguin? Can we see the penguin? It's kind of small for you guys, but just going based on shape alone, if you're close enough, you realize that a lot of it looks very, very similar. So going back to my earlier question, is there a method to the madness? Well, is there one? It looks like some sort of code book. It's possibly a simple XOR operation, which, if you think about it, is an ECB with a block size of one byte. So that brings us to the question, how is the key determined? And that brings us to the same answer I had earlier after spending two days down some rabbit hole. Does it actually matter? Well, in this case, does it actually matter? No, because I see a whole bunch of 4Ds here, a whole bunch of 79s here, a whole bunch of 22s there. What if those are the keys? Because the packets are mostly null bytes. Well, you get that, you get a whole bunch of zeros. And that, right, that looks kind of reasonable. Now the next question, can we verify the key is correct? Well, there's a magic number at the start of all the packets that lines up. It's kind of good news. It's actually magic text. Uh, GT for global time. B space B01N, God knows what that is, because that changes depending on the type of packet. Either way, we can now make sure that a clock is configured by doing two things. Get the config, verify the config. To get the config, we do the same process. We sniff what the crazy Windows application sends, uh, which is that. But this is in Python, a little more condensed, mostly because I didn't want to show you guys a giant block of text. Um, interestingly enough, this 5F, I can't actually change this padding that it uses without also changing these two, because these two will need to be 0 after being xor together. This number somehow magically changes. There is some craziness to this, and I couldn't be bothered to figure it out. So we try it. We get a deobfuscator config. We see things we like. We see things we don't like. Default passwords, by the way. Lovely. Uh, right, so want to ver verify it? Fairly simple. We pull the config. Um, we check if the bytes 080 are there. My first suspicion was correct for how they encode the time zone, by the way. It just turns out it was XORD. Make sure that everything lines up. Great, it's configured. So looking at a review of the features, time zone set, we can do it. NTP service set, we can do it. Check if device is configured, we can do it. What about checking drift, though? It's kind of annoying, right? So can we pull a clock's time and then be able to go, hey, is it set up or not? If it's within some buffer that you like, you go, great, leave it alone. Otherwise, you tell it to resync, right? Once more with feeling, we repeat the process. Where is the time in this madness? Here is the time in this madness. This slide intentionally left blank. What about our old friend, the Windows application? Tab number one, I don't see any time here. Tab number two, I don't see any time here. Tab number three, our clocks don't even have Wi-Fi. What are you doing here? Tab number four, hey, I can change the password. Oh, wait, that doesn't really help me. So even the monstrosity can't pull the time. This is how things are looking right now. <laughs> so we can't really check the drift, but it's all right. We'll live. The clocks run NTP, right? What could go wrong? Well, uh, we can, we get reports. The time is wrong. And things break, right? So when things break, you go into a place like this, you grab a new clock, you plug it in. But you forgot an important step, configuration. There's a whole bunch of technical solutions I could, I could have come up with for this. But the simplest one was a non-technical solution. Um, you take a new clock, you want to put, put it in a new classroom, you plug it in on the IT floor. The server configures the clock, you can now plug it in anywhere. Problem solved, right? Policy solutions. Well, are we done? We think we're done. But then someone comes up to you the next week and goes, the time's wrong, but only by a few minutes. It's five minutes off. But that was the entire point of the exercise. I didn't want different classrooms and different times. What the hell? This, gah! <laughs> I thought there was NTP. This is supposed to solve everything. <laughs> Unfortunately, they only NTP at boot, and then they drift. <laughs> what do? Windows solution, reboot. <laughs> so what do we do today? I'm running low on time, so I'm going to speed this up. Check if a floor's, uh, clock's on the IT floor. If it is, great. Configure it. Um, any clock that goes off the network, it probably still works. I'm going to assume it doesn't. You're a dead clock. Someone's going to come around. We're going to power cycle you first remotely. We can do that because PoE, power over Ethernet. But if that doesn't work, we'll send someone down to fix you. And to keep the sync problem in check, every semester, every holiday, actually, we just reboot the clocks <laughs> because they sync again. It's lovely. Right now, everything works. So the trouble with the original clocks we originally had, 
three of them really solved. Time drifts kind of sort of solved. I mean, it gets kind of bad right before the holiday. Then it fixes itself. And then you end up with 321 of these guys all in the same time, much unlike this picture. That's all I have. Okay, thanks for that.